Hello, listeners, and welcome back to another episode of Discourse for the Religious Studies Project, a series where we talk about how religion is being talked about in the news and the media more broadly. Um, I'm Savannah Finver. I am currently a doctoral student at The Ohio State University. Um, My research focuses on uh, religion, law, and politics in the United States, especially how um, the legal category of religion impacts bodies, uh, different types of bodies in particular ways. Um, I will be your host for today's episode, and today I am very thrilled to be joined by Carmen Becker and Susanna Crockford. Would you both like to introduce yourselves quickly, maybe starting with Carmen? Yeah, surely. Um, Well, my name is Carmen Becker, and I'm a researcher and a teacher here at the Institute for the Study of Religion at Hannover University in Germany. And yeah, my focus is especially on discourses in the public sphere in relation to Muslims, Islam. And I'm very much into theories that somehow discursively um, treat power and power phenomena. So that's what interests me most. Wonderful. And Susanna, how about you? Hi. uh, Yeah, I'm a lecturer at the University of Exeter in the UK. Uh, I'm in the anthropology department and I study religion, ecology and medicine from an ethnographic perspective in the US, especially the southern US and uh, the UK and northern Europe. Wonderful. Thank you so much again, both of you, for being here with us today. I'm really excited for our discussion. And in some of our talks in preparing for today's episode, um, you know, it's been it's been a little bit of a whirlwind, at least for me, uh, you know, in terms of U.S. politics and some of the things that have been uh, popping up in the in the news recently uh, for us here. And we've been, you know, in some of our discussions preparing for today, we we talked a lot about this idea of hegemony broadly conceived, right? We talked about, a lot about the notion of, um, you know, whose beliefs get to count and in what context, um, you know, uh, particularly because it seems all of us have, have an interest in kind of law and politics and how bodies are um, uh regulated and policed and how this term religion as a discursive category becomes operationalized in uh, legal settings. Um, and so um, I guess I'll, I'll start with um, the, the item that has been at the top of, of my list, um, <laughs> which has been the recent Dobbs v. Jackson case um, here in the, that's been moving through the U.S. Supreme Court recently, and um, the uh, uh, recent opinion from Supreme Court Justice Samuel Alito um, that talks about Roe v. Wade. So I'll, I'll give a little bit of background in case listeners haven't heard of this case before. So the Dobbs v. Jackson case um, is basically examining uh, a, a Mississippi law that um, uh basically limits even further, takes limits that are already in place and limits even further the window of opportunity in which women can um, legally pursue uh, medical abortion procedures um, and terminations of their pregnancy here in the U.S. Um, And this has sparked quite a lot of controversy in the news and on social media for us in particular um, uh, as, as... the law put forth by Mississippi, I believe, um, uh, limits the um, uh, limits the window to 15 weeks. Basically, uh, at, after the 15 week point, it becomes illegal to pursue an abortion, and both the the pregnant person and the physicians who assist them in pursuing um, uh, pursuing the procedure um, they can can be punished uh, according to the the law that's put forth by Mississippi. So um, the Supreme Court was, uh, well, there was some suspicion that laws like this were uh, going to be, were were going to proliferate after the appointments of more conservative uh, Supreme Court justices in the U.S., um, particularly during the Trump presidency, and um, the big fear was that the longstanding precedent Roe v. Wade was going to be overturned, right? And Roe v. Wade uh, is a case that 
um, where where abortion is at issue, but is a case also primarily that thinks about privacy rights, right for for women, um, and the there was a recent leak of of uh, Justice Alito's opinion for the uh, Dobbs v. Jackson case, where he very explicitly goes after the precedent set in Roe v. Wade, which um, is, uh, you know, has been viability basically since the 1970s when the fetus, up until the fetus can survive outside of the womb, um, it is a woman's private decision how, what kinds of medical procedures she uh, uh, can pursue. Um, and, you know, the government uh, was not supposed to get involved in any of that. Um, and now, of course, the 15 week mark pushes that up substantially further uh, uh, into the first trimester. Um, so a lot of concerns about this. But actually, what I think is most interesting about this case for my purposes, and I'm curious to hear what y'all think about this, is how uh, religion is has not been brought into the conversation in this case. Um, normally when we think about pro-life stances, I think it's very common. Um, and I've seen at least uh, on my social media, an explosion of, you know, people saying like, you know, keep your Christian beliefs out of the law or things like that, you know, memes to, of that effect. Um, uh, but that's not the legal discussion that's happening, right? The legal discussion that's going on is, um, or what Alito says in his, very, very long opinion, uh, first draft of his opinion is that it's a state's rights issue, which if you're familiar with U.S. history um, at all, you know that states' rights is, has kind of always been a euphemism for uh, slavery and segregation and, and racism, um, you know. And so uh, there seems to be something very, I don't know, kind of Interesting. It's interesting to me the way that this this debate is being framed at this point in time. That religion is not the operative category in the legal discussion, um, and I don't know. The inclusion of the states' rights language feels, I don't know, almost somewhat sinister to me. I'm curious <laughs> what what both of you make of it, or if you you know, uh, uh, neither of you are are living in the U.S., right? So I'm curious to hear what the reaction has been across the pond, so to say, uh, to some of uh, to some of what's been going on over here. Or has it come up in the news for y'all? I mean, it's come up in my news, but that's literally because I did live in the U.S. for so long. <laughs> so, so much of my social media is Americans. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so I, I've lived in Arizona for many years. If I counted it all up, I've lived in Arizona for five out of the last 10 years. Um, so I don't know how much of an unfiltered British opinion of this I could give you. <laughs> um, because in Britain, the right to abortion exists. Um, and we actually have, you know, it was it was Ireland and Northern Ireland that had abortion were, were illegal there for a long time. I think it's now legal in the Republic of Ireland, but it's still illegal in the North. And women would have to actually travel to the UK to get an abortion. And in the oh, UK, wow. it's very medicalized. You have to get two doctors' permission uh, in order to get an abortion. And there's this kind of like clause where it's like the mental health of the mother or something like that. It's like the mental well-being of the mother is a reason for a doctor to say you can get an abortion. And it's kind of like known, as long as you don't go to what's known as the wrong sort of doctor, i.e. A, <laughs> a, a pro-life doctor, that they will just sign you off and, and you will be able to get an abortion. And it will be covered by the NHS, right? It will be covered by state uh, sponsored healthcare. So, and you don't have any of that in the US, right? It, right. It, it, you know, you don't have universal healthcare. So none of it right. is covered. And there's even things, I think it's the Hyde Amendment, which prevents federal funding of any, any kind of abortion services. So where I lived in Arizona, there's one abortion provider for the whole of Northern Arizona. So half of a state, right? Right. State and Arizona is like, a huge state. It's, huge. it's like 13 <laughs> times the size of the UK, right? And there's like 8 million people. And there's in the South, there's more because you've got the cities of Phoenix and Tucson. But in the North, there's one abortion provider and it's Planned Parenthood and it's in Flagstaff. And if Roe v. Wade falls, the abortion law that will come into force is from 1902 and it bans all abortion, right? Um, right. So, it's, it's, so it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of levels to this. One is the healthcare level. Like it's not covered by women's 
women's health care at all. Another is the legal level, right? You know, if you go to states' right, then the states have this kind of patchwork of often very old, very retrograde laws, which are suddenly going to come into force. Um, and you're right, states' states' rights. I mean, it's like states' right to do what, guys? We all know what states' right is a cover for. It's states' rights to discriminate against pe- like whole categories of people and, in fact, to hold slaves. So you're like, no one's really convinced, I, th- I think, or at least anyone who pays attention is convinced by the states' rights argument. Um, but again, like, I don't know. I feel like because I'm so <laughs> used to like being in America and having these kinds of discussions, I remember many years ago before I ever even started my fieldwork in America talking about the Civil War and going, oh, it's something to do with states' rights, isn't it? And people would just, and people in England would just be like, yeah, sh- sure, that, that's sure. what they say. <laughs> so I think when you're like out of the kind of American way of thinking, states' rights actually sounds like a real thing and not like a cover for something else, which is, you know, what it actually is. So I don't know, Carmen, what do you think? Does states' rights, what does that mean to you? It's very obscure to me. <laughs> it's <laughs> something I can make sense of also from a German perspective. Um, the way it's being reported on here, I mean, it's definitely in the news media here, it has been uh, when it came up. Um, I was really curious of how the news media here would actually thematize it, you know, what, what they would talk about. And I thought they would also talk about the German abortion law, or there is no abortion law, actually. Um, the German, or in Germany, abortion is actually prohibited under the criminal code, but there are conditions upon which it's, uh, it's allowed. So it's, and it's even more restricted than in Mississippi, for example, in the, in the law that is supposed to get through in Mississippi. Um, here you can get an abortion until week 12, if I'm, yeah, if I'm correctly. And upon the condition that you go through a man, uh, obligatory counseling. And here the church is coming because they do the counseling to the women. So you have to go and get a certificate from a from an organization that does the counseling. They are all certified. And it's usually the churches who do that. And then with this certificate, you can go to a doctor and get an abortion, basically. And um, interestingly, um, medical uh, staff or doctors are not allowed to inform about abortion on their websites because this is considered to be advertisement of abortion and this is prohibited under the criminal code. So it's, it's very, I mean, I find it very interesting on all the conditions that are put on how, where, when, you know, to get abortion. So I think actually the, the, the discussion in the United States for me sounds much more straightforward and honest than what's going on in Germany, actually, with all these kind conditions and, and options that are put on the table. And I thought that the media would actually come and problematize it because, I mean, uh, but this didn't happen. So I thought maybe they would think, oh, my God, here it's only 12 week. And in the United States, there's a, as a law being discussed. Uh, it's uh, restricting it uh, to 15 weeks. So something is going wrong here, perhaps. But actually, the way it's being framed mostly is, oh, look at again at the United States. Um, they have a history of religious activism in the public sphere. It's very religious, more religious than in Germany. And here there's the law um, that's being put forward. And it's influenced by religion, basically. So I thought it was really interesting how it's framed from the German media side and nobody getting the idea to make a comparison, right, to what's going on in Germany. So that's really interesting. But you, uh, Savannah, you said that there's religion was not involved in the discussions or wasn't mentioned. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I, I found this particularly interesting. And I've, uh, I've been discussing this with my um, supervisor for my PhD, because uh, one of the issues I'm looking at in my dissertation is abortion. So we've been Mm -hmm. kind of following this law (laughs) together and talking about it as things have come up. And it was actually um, my my supervisor, Isaac Weiner, his insight first, he was like, go back and and listen to the arguments again, because they're, they're not using the language of of religion in the arguments. They're using the, the um, argument of, of states' rights, that the Constitution, mm-hmm. uh, you know, focuses, um, it focuses law federally, but that people on the right or cons- uh, conservatives more broadly um, ha- have always kind of pushed to have power separated and given back to the, yeah. to the states in order to avoid that really strong central government. Um, and so, yeah, there hasn't been a lot of mention actually in the, from the legal side of things, right? 
But when you go to the media and particularly social media, what people are saying is not states' rights. It seems like nobody's convinced by that argument, <laughs> similarly to what uh, Susanna was saying before. Uh, but um, people, you know, uh, everyday people outside of the legal sphere are saying, no, this is very clearly a Christian belief that's being uh, imposed upon upon women through the mechanism of the law and just being talked about in, in other terms. Um, and so you're seeing a lot of revival of the like separation of church and state memes <laughs> have been popping up a lot. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's very, the, the disconnect there between what's happening legally and how it's being described legally versus the way that, um, people in the everyday are talking about it on the internet it is is pretty fascinating to me right like i think that people are feeling like a religious belief is being smuggled into the law using so called secular language that seems to be the reaction it's also i mean here it's also very often framed in the language of ethics i mean the yeah. main question is when does a cell turn into a human being right Right. Um, and what are the indicators of such a transformation? And, uh, and then you have usually councils with different experts, philosophers, and of course also churches again are in there. Um, so um, different people who have to say something or have some expertise somehow on ethics. And I think it's very interesting to see who is allowed to talk about ethical questions like this and what what is considered to be expertise <laughs> in this context. So I wonder, is this again yeah. a discussion in the United States or in Great Britain in any way? The, the, the kind of, you know, idea that there's a cell and at one point in the development it turns into a human being and we have to identify scientifically this point in time and then we can have a straightforward law. Basically, that's the idea behind it here. Of course, it's never resolved <laughs> the question. Right, because it's not, I, yeah, it's about when does when does a human life start, right? Yeah, Which, yeah. And that's always a... Uh, you know, I, I would argue a religious question, right? That's a yeah. belief, right? What makes a human being? What makes a person? And there's all the exceptions, right? You know, the life of the mother is often a big legal exception, right? So that there yeah. are, and it was the case in Colorado for a long time. I don't, they may have changed it now, but that you could get an abortion right up to the third trimester if the life of the mother was seriously at risk. And that may have changed. Um but you know, so it was also it's it's about when does life begin, but it's also about like whose life matters more, right? If this child is going to be born, if it's going to mean the mother dies, then in a lot of jurisdictions, that's a reason for abortion. If it's the creation of rape or incest, that's another exception, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. another thing where it's kind of seen that well, the value of that life should not be as much as the value of the mother's life and the the trauma that she would have to go through. She had to carry this to term and then have racist child which obviously puts you in a legal relationship with the father of that child right um which can be extremely problematic for anyone who's left an abusive relationship so it's about also like kind of weighing rights and I think mm -hmm. one of the things at least when I, I kept reading about this um at least on kind of what was kept coming up on my social media was kind <laughs> of like it wasn't just this case right it's not just abortion it's like what is this saying about rights and what are rights in the u.s because there was this like phrase that alito used at some point that was like you know that these rights haven't been enshrined in the constitution mm -hmm. it's like yeah. no yep. there's a lot of rights that aren't that in haven't the been enshrined <laughs> are you gonna take all of those away now and there's a sense of like creep like right? like yeah. the creeping theocracy is the fear i see a lot from people yes. I, I still know in america that you know it's going to be abortion now and then what's it going to be interracial marriage is it going to be gay right. marriage is obergefell going to be aimed at next you know and it's like the what next is the big fear right because abortion's been dismantled for so long like there's a law in texas i think it is where it's like six weeks <laughs> you're barely bad. not pregnant no, a yeah. lot of women don't know that six weeks how are you going to even right. know to get an abortion and that is basically like de facto criminalization of abortion right mm -hmm. right and oklahoma just in introduced a new law uh that i i had seen in the news recently that's basically at the moment of fertilization which you know <laughs> what like, how do you what <laughs> like, right? there's no way there's like not even a way to scientifically even verify that <laughs> like right? you know and then and then another issue especially with states like 
like Oklahoma that women are talking about. Um, so, for example, in Oklahoma, there have been laws that have punished women for having miscarriages, um, mm-hmm. you know, and and especially if you're going to move the line all the way back to fertilization. I mean, it is extremely common that the body will naturally abort. Yeah. You know, I mean, that's why it takes people so long to get pregnant. It's like, you know, these people writing these laws have never taken a high school biology class. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, I don't know. It's just I, I, I agree with what Susanna was saying. I think there is a fear that the the laws are going to be pushed back and pushed back back, you know, or the protections are going to be pushed back and pushed back. And, and again, uh, a lot of the, the protections that we enjoy now are not enshrined in the constitution. And going back to that idea again, of who gets to count as a human, I would agree, Susanna is a fundamentally theological question. Um, mm-hmm. you know, where it, it seems to be firmly rooted in, in, Christian understandings of the separation between like people and things. Right. Um, and at what point does a fetus go from being a thing to a human? Um, and of course tied up in all of that are again, questions of race that are similarly tied to Mm -hmm. the state's rights rhetoric. So I think all of that is, is being brought up and called into question now. Well, then it's interesting how these theological of, basically theological questions are secularized or put into secular language, right? And this is, I think, what's yeah. happening here every time we, it's discussed here again. And again, this is due to the, the ethical discourse around it, basically. Yeah. So also churches really try to put forward secularized, you know, strategies <laughs> to, to forward their, their positions and their points. Um, they don't do it in straightforward, usually yeah, straightforward theological language, right? But of course, it's it's. I mean, it's just a veneer. <laughs> it's just <laughs> shimmering under it. So, but I mean, and and uh, so, would it then be a sort of, or is it framed as as a sort of turning point uh, from from many people in in the United States that this was just put uh, or lead to a watershed and 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 uh, the, the the restriction of abortion rights or. I think a lot of people just thought that this wouldn't happen, right? Because it felt mm. like this, this This is settled law, right? Roe v. Wade is settled law. So it's its not, yes. you know, per okay. precedent, it's not meant to be overturned now, theoretically. So the idea that it, it's kind of an idea that maybe they're moving backwards, right? You know, and kind of paraphrasing Dr. King, it's like the long arc of justice was meant to be going one way in the US. And this would be, I think, is it being taken as evidence that actually it's not that there's this massive conservative backlash that is operating on a very kind of gradual legal level and it's actually diminishing and taking away rights from groups who had kind of fought and and won those rights so that's where you know especially the question of race comes in it's like because well if Roe v Wade isn't settled law is the Civil Rights Act right Mm -hmm. loving which is the interracial marriage uh, supreme case law you know there's there's other supreme court decisions which are very kind of instrumental in the law on race about kind of citizenship and personhood because of course in the constitution black people were not considered persons they were not considered slaves uh they so they were considered slaves because they weren't considered citizens and persons right So the idea that you can somehow take away everything that's not enshrined in the Constitution is actually very dangerous in the American Mm -hmm. context. It means rolling back pretty much all of the civil rights movement and their legal gains. Potentially. (laughs) (laughs) I feel like like there's like this kind of, oh, no, everything's like dire that you can easily fall into. But obviously this hasn't happened yet. It was still just a, a draft opinion, right? It's not. Right. It hasn't happened yet. I just wanted to yeah. signpost that. <laughs> <laughs> it is still just a draft opinion, and there is some speculation that maybe uh, because of the backlash that came after it, perhaps some votes will change. And, yeah, and this is also part of the I, – I don't think – I mean I, – I don't think I don't they know. care. I, I, <laughs> right. agree. I don't think they care. <laughs> right. It's, uh, well, and they've always kind of prided themselves on that, the U.S. Supreme sure. Court, right, is that they don't take public opinion into account. And so, you know, I think the big the, – the question is not so much about conservative justices and where they're going to fall. I think uh, Chief Justice Roberts was a big question. You know, where was his vote 
going to line up. Um, but it still seems that, the, you know, the conservatives are going to have the the majority either way. And so it, it seems likely that even if Roe v. Wade is not entirely uh, overturned, that huge parts of it are going to be uh, reworked and refigured. Um, and especially because U S law is, is premised on the idea of, of stare decisis, right. Of, of setting a precedent and then sticking to it. Uh, and Roe v. Wade has been the president since the seventies. Um, you know, again, yeah, it brings up these questions of, okay, well, if we can chip away at this civil right, if we can chip away at privacy, Mm -hmm. you know, when can we, what else can we chip away at? Um, and I think so there, I think, I mean, even though it's not a settled opinion yet, I think we can be sh- pretty confident that this is the direction things are going to move with this very conservative court that we have. Um, I think also there is a real concern among uh, liberals and leftists that this is just going to increase kind of extremist divides between the right and the left, right? That people who are, uh, who tend to lean more liberal are going to flee to liberal states and that people who um, are more conservative will flee to conservative states and that will just increase even more greatly the divides that have been happening as a result of the culture wars. I think it's interesting the. That- What's really striking about the issue of abortion is that in terms of like public opinion, which, you know, in democracy, that's what's meant to matter, right? What people think right. and believe. Um, every, like the majority support abortion. It's something like 68% of people or something support Roe v. Wade and they, they think abortion in America should be legal. And yet when you're looking at where the power is, it's in the courts, which have been heavily packed with conservative justices. And when it comes to like, you know, the question we're talking about, whose belief matters, it seems like that the kind of beliefs of religious conservatives are protected by religious freedom laws and that the beliefs of conservatives are allowed to work in this kind of, under this kind of ostensible kind of legalistic guise of, and they're allowed to work the kind of mechanisms of power in the way that other beliefs are not. Um, and I think that's why it's kind of interesting because obviously we all spend a lot of time thinking about religion so we can like look at these things and go, wow, that's a theological debate. But a lot of people will look at questions like, when does life begin? And not see theology and not see mm-hmm. religion because, well, you know, the person who was talking about it wasn't sitting inside a church, right? So this is like really kind of, I would say, narrow view of what religion is. Well, if we're going to talk about religion, it has to be something to do with like church and people who are in church. But Obviously, we all talk about it in this way much, much broader, like as about belief and about like the things that kind of people think that have no real empirical basis, right? They're just things that we all collectively agreed on. And then that's, you know, you think about abortion, it's like everyone sees, at least the majority seems to believe that abortion should be legal. But the way that power is working is to limit and un- kind of negate that. And that's very interesting. Um, and so, you know, what where is like the power in this this particular jurisdiction and 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 why why is it that this particular kind of subset of like kind of very very conservative kind of theological and political thought seems to have such dominance and how is that happening in a you know in an ostensible democracy? It's happening in the UK as well. Like I, I absolutely see it happening in the UK as well. This is incredibly kind of like like slow march towards like limiting human rights and limiting civil liberties. And the example I came up with this was like the, it's called the police crime and sentencing and courts bill. Um, And what that bill does, right. It was passed this year. It was passed incredibly quickly for the UK. It's already got Royal assent, which is when the queen goes, yes, gives her, her stamp of approval. And what it says is that the police can basically restrict any protest if they can show it is a serious public disorder, a serious damage to property, or serious disruption, or it's a serious annoyance. I mean, what is protest, right? <laughs> protest is meant to be annoying. It's, it's annoying, be, yeah. yeah. It's meant to be a disruption. Yeah. That's right. what it does. And they're saying, no, if you're doing a protest in a way we don't like, that someone is going to find annoying, where you get to basically imprison people, give them fines up to £2,500, and imprison wow. them up for up to a year. And up to 10 years if you deface a monument, right? 
Why is that? <laughs> the monuments are so important that they get even more time in prison. If you, it's because they pulled down, a, a, they, a, so in Bristol, yeah. there was a, a statue of a slave, us, Colston, and they pulled it down. And um, the people who did it got off because they asked the jury, you know, you know, if there was if this was like uh, it was it was based on like whether they were like sincerely believe what they were doing was right and this jerry actually said yes actually this is fine we should take down <laughs> statues of slave traders you know and so that kind of that's an interesting thing it's like well we're trying to like move the society in a way that you know kind of is more in line with what most people believe most people believe we should not celebrate slave traders right most people believe we should have a right to protest you know and the protests that are being most kind of restricted by this bill are by a group called the Extinction Rebellion. They do things like, you know, occupy entire streets in London, like the main tourist streets like Trafalgar Square and things like that. And then they stick themselves to boats or they stick themselves to government buildings or the top of tube trains, right? And then the whole tube train has to get cancelled. There's always stories in the tabloid press in, in the UK is awful. And they just, they always take like the most emotive angle and they're like, and they blocked an ambulance and there was a pensioner in the ambulance there's always like a pensioner in the ambulance right and it's made to make this particular group sound very bad right to turn public opinion against them um and so this bill would pretty much criminalize all of the actions that they've been doing in terms of kind of gluing themselves to government buildings but what they're protesting is climate change right they're protesting the fact that there's absolutely or very little uh, kind of action on climate change from a governmental level. That eighty percent of the UK's energy still comes from fossil fuels. Um, you know, so where do all those lives that are affected by that come to matter in this discourse? Right? You know, why isn't their belief that we should, you know, do something about this existential problem in any way protected as much as you know the lives of you know other people who who you know seem to have this very kind of limited sense of what life is you know a life is a fetus inside a mother's belly but you know once it get out we don't really care about it that much we're not going to give it like a livable planet or anything right you just have to have right. the baby that you know that's where these kind of i think this question of hegemony comes like where is life and, and when does it matter right yeah whose lives <laughs> whose lives, <laughs> whose lives right? matter yeah whose lives yes, matter right. <laughs> <laughs> right it was a black lives that i'm matter protest that was happening when they pulled down that set that you which is not an insignificant detail right right because that was the question they posed right in the whole mo movement right and then it's like it immediately gets drowned out by this counter reaction well all lives matter but do they actually right it's this right. level between ideology and reality because actually what this limitation of abortion seems to be saying in the u.s is that actually a, a very specific type of life's matter not the mother's life right right <laughs> And it's the same in the in the protest laws that you're mentioning too. Like who, you know, the the respectable, you know, citizen quietly in their homes, their opinions matter. You know, their their peaceful, you know, their right to a peaceful life matters. But what about the right to a livable planet, as you said? Um, yeah, Carmen, what are what are your thoughts on? Yeah, I'm this? just thinking of what kind of what forms of protests would still be legitimate then or, or legal? So it would be basically online petitions would be okay, I guess, and yeah. everything that's not right. bodily interrupting anything of and make, makes a difference in, in, in daily affairs. So, <laughs> so basically it would just be large marches that are kind of organized by kind of mm -hmm. recognized groups, like the actions that always happen around the COP, the yeah. The they, they, there's always that protest around the cop, right? So that would be okay as long as they're agreed weeks in advance. The route is agreed with the police mm -hmm. and they can go a certain route. Everyone walks their route. They have their placards. They say their business and then it comes around to an end and then everyone goes home, right? So this very kind of like <laughs> sanitized, organized, approved form of protest, that's what's okay. But okay. any kind of standstill protest where someone like refuses to move and makes a noise while they're doing it, that's now can be... Uh, wow. <laughs> yeah, that's now a criminal offense. So yeah. as, long as, as long as you're on your, like, you know, your march that they don't mind about, that they've agreed to, that's okay. But if you try and do anything that is actually <laughs> protesting, right? <laughs> So there's no way to have a spontaneous protest uh, because usually, I mean, here I've been part in protests where people gather and then on the spot they register with the police. They register the protest as a protest officially, as a demonstration, and then it's protected by a legal right to, to protest. 
But that would be impossible then, right? To do something on the spot coming out of spontaneous action. Yeah, especially if it's a large scale gathering that you have, yeah. have an advance warning. So much nice to have a planned life. What's ahead and politicians can react and the, the police can react properly. And it's all civilized. Nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah, a good thing to have. <laughs> barriers up to stop the traffic exactly, yeah. you know there's the wardens in their hivers jackets yeah yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. everything is clearly classified actually <laughs> so you know yeah. you know yeah. where you have to go in order to ask questions as a yeah. journalist and stuff the people are having their voice you have your right to expression here yeah, we have allowed yeah, it yeah, yeah, yeah. in the specific format but don't disturb <laughs> be an annoyance i feel like there's something yeah. very british about that but we don't want anyone <laughs> to be annoyed <laughs> yeah. especially yeah, not yeah, anyone uh, in power you can't possibly be annoyed or disrupted or disturbed yeah. by anything it's also a denigration right of, of 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 many things that people think it's important right because i mean yeah it's like you're being annoyed by it by by protests right so you have to say okay there is a legal right for protest so let's do it in this and this way but let us continue in our daily affairs yeah. let's not be 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 be, I don't know, pushed into a corner uh, in order to reflect on what we are doing, right? <laughs> and forced to reflect on what we are doing. Let's, let's go on. Um, yeah. I think it just fits wonderfully in how things are going on at the moment, right? right? Let's go on with business as usual. But of course, we recognize that you have the right, right, to, to, to protest and that there might be a little bit of a concern about climate change, right? But let's do it in a civilized way. <laughs> Basically, that means that everything should go on, you know, as it's as it used to be in the last twenty years. Yep. So. Yeah. So. It's like we registered oh. your disagreement. Now business. Yeah. Right. You just your formula. Yes. <laughs> Fill in the form. Acknowledge. <laughs> Get your stamp. stamp. And we acknowledge this. <laughs> <laughs> we received your petition. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. It brings up the question for me of like what kind of speech is allowed to count as free, right? Like free Mm -hmm. speech is like considered, you know, the hallmark of liberal democracy, right? That you have a right to say what you want to say, but it seems that, you know, I mean, or at least that's the, I see your face. (laughs) No, free free speech in America is different to free speech in Europe, right? In Europe, there are certain types of speech that are banned, right? Like, how many know this, right? In Germany, it, you're not allowed to be a Nazi, for example, right? There are certain and, signs and symbols you're not supposed to, to show, yeah. basically. Yeah. 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 There's, a, there's been an addition to it recently. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> right. For a yeah. good reason as well. Like, we've been down this road. We yeah. know where the path of absolute free speech lies, and it lies in being taken advantage of by extremists, mm. right? So, you know, I always find whenever Americans start going on about free speech, I always get my skeptical face on because I'm like, mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and even in America, free speech is not it's not an absolute It's not right. totally you know, free. If, if right. you make a threat, that's a crime still. Yeah. Right. Right. There are certain forms of speech that are not allowed. Um, and also it's kind of like there's this real blurring of free speech. Like people think it means they have the right to say whatever they want, wherever they want. But it doesn't. It just means you have the right not to get imprisoned by the government for it. Which, again, is also not the same in Europe. Like, for example, in the UK, we have no right to silence. If you are silent when the police question you, that is taken as an implication of guilt. That's interesting. And that came through for a specific reason, because during the Troubles, when Britain and Ireland were essentially at war, although we don't like to call it that, you know, that would be very unpleasant to say that, but the IRA, when they were taken prisoner, they would just say nothing. And then the British government got very frustrated with this, and so they took away our right to silence in, I think it was 1992. Wow. Yeah. So there's like this progressive restriction of civil liberties, right? Often. I thought that was standard that you're informed that you have that you're allowed to stay silent <laughs> when uh, when you have, <laughs> you have a dealing with the police. So okay, no. that's, that's not maybe that's just a U.S. thing, I guess. Well, uh, you know, we always you think it's normal, but that's because you hear it on TV a lot, uh, right? <laughs> exactly. Right, right. That's, 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 that's American. <laughs> <laughs> and that's all american right <laughs> you have yes. to write the speak the, to, to stay silent in the, it's part of the of the mantra <laughs> yeah. yeah 
Um, I see that we are getting close to the 40 minute mark and I wanted to just make sure, um, Carmen, we haven't yet gotten a chance to, um, talk a little bit about the, the Russia Ukraine, co- uh, conflict. And I feel like this was an issue that was important to you in some of our discussions. So I wanted to make sure we make yeah. time to, to bring that up in the context of our discussion yeah. about, uh, hegemony and beliefs. Um, so I think it connects yeah. to this, a few points you, we've discussed so far, because what, what, kept, what kept me busy in recent weeks is how this is being discussed in Germany and how this reconfigures certain discourses over here. So I look at uh, the war in Ukraine and at the invasion, not through what is actually happening there on the ground, but how this is uh, is translated as a discursive event here in the German public sphere. And all of a sudden, things are possible that haven't been possible before. And um, I think my, 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 my notion is, or my understanding is basically that this what is happening in the Ukraine or in Ukraine is, is framed to be singular, right? So it's ahistorical. It has no, no context, basically. Mm-hmm. And then... There are two things that I found very interesting um, and also alarming to a certain degree. The first thing, again, we have the comparison to Hitler coming up in the German public sphere. <laughs> so uh, Putin is Hitler and um, the atrocities that um, Russian soldiers are committing, which are still being also ex- examined and analyzed. That's, there's no final judgment, of course, but the atrocities, they're also partly compared to the Holocaust. And this is something that would have been a no-go, you know, usually in in, in in Germany, that you, you compare the Holocaust to something else, because this is a, the true singular event in the German narrative. And to be able to, to, you know, to somehow compare a current event to the Holocaust, I think it's, it's very interesting to me to see this coming up in the public sphere. And of course, there are people who say, okay, we have to be careful, but it's not this huge protest that comes up when everything, every time this has happened in the past. Now, every time, for example, Palestinians have compared um, what's happening to them in the Palestinian territories to a Holocaust, it would have been, yeah, totally silence, basically. It would have been a huge outcry. Now, whether that, that's okay or not, it's something else. But here it comes up again. And there is some resistance by some people. But basically, it's they say, yeah, there's something terribly happening there. It's huge. And it's, it's also, you know, um, somehow... Um, you know, also uh, there's this the, the whole the flow of 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 um, pictures of images coming in that are horrible, and they're all framed partly in atrocities, in genocide, of the terms. So it's 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 really difficult to actually uh, stay out of this logic. You know, not to compare it to something really terrible and big in the past. So I thought this was really interesting to see, and. Every time people or their um, experts or sociologists or political scientists who try to use analytical categories to analyze what is going on there, they're being partly pushed back because uh, and they have to uh, hear um, that they should not be talking uh, whataboutism. You know, they should not compare this to something else because this is whataboutism. So there is no, there's a lack of, of comparison actually. The things that have happened before are happening right now in other uh, regions in the world. So I think it's very interesting to see the, these discursive strategies going on. And then there are certain positions that cannot be said anymore, right? I'm not talking about pro- pro-Putin uh, activists here. I'm just talking about people who are basically putting questions mar- question marks uh, to the narratives that Zelensky is putting forward in, a so- in social media and, and saying he's part of the, the war. So this is also a certain frame, a certain angle, a certain perspective, and we should be careful, you know, on how we treat his perspective and how we build our own position towards it. Even those people are being, yeah, pushed back, you know, because it's something singular. <laughs> and Zelensky is then, Zelensky is then a, a hero, you know, um, who stands for a certain suffering. And, and it's also very nationalist, partly, how it's being portrayed here. So I think this is very interesting to see what's happening over here. And I'm wondering whether it's a bit the same in Great Britain or in the US. Um, I have a feeling it's a bit specific to Germany because due to history, due to the Holocaust, um, that especially Germans feel very much eager to stay on the side of those suffering, you know. <laughs> and it's clear who's suffering right now is, your, is the Ukrainian people, right? So they have to be some supported unconditionally. So that's very interesting. And this has material uh, um, 
uh, consequences. You know, it's something that wouldn't have been possible just a few months ago. Is has been that the, the chancellor here he committed Germany to spend a minimum of two percent of the GDP on defense per year as of 2022. Something Germany has never done before. And it's, of course, something that the NATO has been uh, asking for a long time. Also, um, um, U.S. American presidents for a long time. Now, of, all of a sudden, it's possible. And there has been a specific uh, military spending budget of over 100 billion euros all of a sudden coming out of nowhere that can be spent now on military equipment. And this is nothing that is actually helping Ukrainians right now because this would be in the future, right? And it's for German defense. But all of a sudden, this has been coming up. And I think this is really interesting. And if people protest against it, they are framed as being naive, you know, being out of touch with reality and not understanding the danger Putin is posing to Germany. So Germany is defended in, in, in Ukraine, basically, at the moment. This is how people... Also, I think still fear in the public sphere and how it's being framed. I think it's really interesting how there's this realignment going on in Europe because, yeah, yeah it's Germany is increasing their defense spending. Sweden and Finland are yeah. actually joining NATO. Now, this used to be unthinkable. They were always neutral and they were neutral because of their proximity to Russia. That mm -hmm. was one of the big issues, especially for Finland, who actually had that long land border with Russia. Now in the UK, like I, you know, we're a militaristic nation and every time there's a war, you know, we join along with the US, like Iraq, Afghanistan, mm -hmm. you know, and it, so it wasn't, I wasn't in no way surprised. And I don't think anyone else was surprised that that was the UK position. And yes, Ukraine is seen as like, that's our side. We're on that side. And um, but that's kind of normal for the UK. The UK always picks a side, right? And is always like throws its, <laughs> throws its like lot in. It's like a real colonial kind of uh, kind of history there. Of like, yeah, we're going to be on on this guy's side, and it's usually America's, right? Um, and but then if you compare the response to the Ukraine conflict, then to for example to the Balkans war, because everyone's like, oh my god, war in Europe, and but everyone who like has any notion of European history is like, yes, war in Europe, like that does happen. <laughs> all the time <laughs> for the hundreds of years. That's like what we do. So, you know, the, in the 90s, there was the Balkans War, you know, so yeah, yeah. broke up. that was a huge war, right? But it was so like, no one wanted to get involved. And those were atrocities, right? There was Srebrenica massacre, you know, there was ethnic cleansing of uh, Bosnian Muslims and ethnic Serbs, right? These were atrocities, but it took so long for the UN and for the rest of Europe to do anything. And now in Ukraine, it's so quick. It's so and quick, I, right? It's yeah. so quick. And that to me yeah. is like, okay, that means something else is going on. And I think it's a lot to do with this realignment against Russia. You know, yeah. I think the rest yeah. of Europe is going, okay, who's next, right? <laughs> <laughs> They're all waiting. <laughs> After yeah. Ukraine, who's yeah. next, right? Yeah. Is it Poland? And so they're kind of realigning to form this block against Russia. So when people say war in Europe, it's like, yeah, but no, one of the big ones. I think that that's the fear. I think it's also interesting that everybody needs to position him or herself, you know, towards the yeah. war somehow. I mean, we, I'm, uh, I'm part of the executive committee of the European Association for the Study of Religion. And even there, we were discussing a text, you know, a statement on the war in Ukraine. Right. And I mean, so many wars around the world, we've never had any statements. You could say, okay, it's part of Europe, so we have to say something. Of course, the Ukrainian Association is part of the European Association, or belongs to it, so that, that's fair. But then um, the no ideas we discussed were about, well, it's a bit like the Olympics, so we say that Russians are allowed to take part in our conference, but not running under their nation. I said, I don't run under the German nation either when I go to a conference. It's <laughs> but we were thinking about you know, how we sanction Russia. And I, I thought, well, that's, I mean, we are academics. This is an academic association. We're not, we don't have the power to sanction anything. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we should not overestimate our power, you know. That's all so, I can think whenever there are these statements by academic associations like, we stand against XYZ and we stand yeah. for. It's like, no one asked you, though, did they? <laughs> right? you, you have no power. You're not yeah. at this table, right? You're not, yeah. You don't have a. Like, why are you doing this? But I feel there's like a certain amount of performative politics. Yeah. But I think, I mean, we came up with a, a statement that was okay for <laughs> I thought. I think it's just a drive, you know, to, to position yourself. Yeah. And, and, and uh, I mean, you don't have, we don't have the mandate for this, actually. It's, it's politics. Um, of course, academics is also, academia is also political, but it's not our, 
we are not elected, <laughs> you know, represented, uh, representations right. of, of, of nations. So it's, yeah. it's really interesting how uh, there was an urge, you know, to do that. But, but we were also called upon doing to do that. So that's really interesting. It's kind that. of a double bind, I think, for yeah. academic associations. Because if you say nothing, everyone's like, and you have been silenced on this, yeah. right? Like that's some yeah. kind of huge, like deficit of the association yeah. that they're not taking a stand and you're like, complicit yeah right you're complicit right <laughs> yeah, and like yeah. they're letting it happen yes you know the yeah. european association for the study of religion you're in it yeah. but like but then if you don't if you do then you're kind of making this stance about like well you know that actually you have no power to enact anything on this and especially it's, like it's a no-win situation yeah, it's a no-win situation <laughs> and like also who are we meant to be representative of like a lot of academics work outside of their their yeah, country's yeah. citizenship right so yeah, who, that's true you know are you talking about russian academics in germany and like in france or are you talking about you know people in russia who are working in universities because they're not necessarily russian right so like mm. there's this really complicated like politics of belonging in academia which I <laughs> yeah you're not representative at all how could you sanction anyone yeah. it's that's really weird but then, I mean it's actually the, the, the nationalist narrative that comes back in I mean it's also when you know every time the Polish when, when the Polish association or the Lithuanian association helps the Ukrainian association it's actually Poland and, and, and Lithuania helping U Ukraine and I, I don't know. no it's just associations you know yeah. helping each other <laughs> it's not <laughs> one country helping the other so but it's, i think it's in the mind of many people right now again thinking in nations mm -hmm. now it's big again also yeah. in germany it's there's nothing globalizing anymore <laughs> it's no. nothing translocal anymore no. we're all back to nations again we're being drawn back inside our borders yeah. i think this is happening really yeah, strongly yeah, yeah. and there's like so many different ways i can see it happening like it's so hard mm to be working outside of your country of citizenship right now so yeah. hard and so and and even for me right now it's it's hard to want to do my university doesn't want us to do field work for more than three months outside of the UK for tax reasons so, so you can't <laughs> even do research outside so we're like being like legally drawn within our borders like and it's like that's where you gotta stay right <laughs> But well, then it makes sense to increase the defense budget, right? <laughs> if you're inside the borders, you... Yes, well, inside the borders. You defenses you up. This is entirely the process of militarism, right? You draw yeah. inside the borders, you reinforce the borders against the people you've yeah. defined as outside of those borders, and then you build up your defense capability, and then you decide who your enemies yeah. are. And it just feels like there's this whole narrative, right? It's just, like you were saying, Carmen, if you like analyze the discourse, there's this way this narrative is going, and it's a really dangerous yeah, yeah. direction, and it's absolutely terrifying. It is, <laughs> indeed. I feel like that's the story of the times, right? It's all right. absolutely <laughs> terrifying. It's all terrifying. Um, Dark times. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. It's it's interesting, too, just to bring us back full circle and to the concept of, of race that we were talking about earlier as well in terms of the way that the Russian-Ukraine co uh, conflict has been – discussed and critiqued in the media here, or the, the response to it has been critiqued uh, here uh, in the U.S. because it's like there was, as, you, as both of you were saying, this like kind of rush to take a side, right? This mm -hmm. rush to identify on one side or the other and, and to um, when, when there have been conflicts happening all over the world, you know, consistently, you know, that we have ignored or not taken sides on, or, you know, there hasn't been a rush to protect people. And one of the major critiques that has come up in, in the U S is that, well, uh, Ukrainian citizens are white Christians. Um, and so that is why there's a rush to take a side, um, to align ourselves with, with Ukraine in this conflict. I mean, I can't, I think you also can't take out the historical, uh, uh, tension between the U.S. and Russia and, and the closeness of the Cold War, right, uh, and how, how much clo Cold War propaganda still influences um, uh, ideologies and thoughts in the, in the U.S., but um, also, I think, uh, again, uh, questions of race and minoritized bodies and who gets yeah. to be protected are, become central yet again. Um, in these There's a hierarchization of, of refugees here in Germany going on. I mean, because yeah. Ukrainian refugees, and I think it's great. They should get all the help, you know, <laughs> they need. <laughs> but I mean, I, I know many refugee groups, and they are saying, well, basically, we have to step back, 
right now and wait until our cases are processed, until this wave of, of, of refugees is over, and then we will be, you know, again, the ones who will be processed. So it, it's interesting who takes, pre, you know, who takes, um, who can go first, you know, and who has to wait and step back. I know many yeah. Iranians here who have been here on asylum cases for years, and they say, well, I was just informed by my case officer that I have to wait another three months, at least for a decision, because first I have to process Ukrainian uh, refugees. And um, so, I mean, it, it's great that there's a lot of funding also put in there, but it's interesting. Uh, but then again, you get a, being accused of autobotism. I think it's interesting if, when you con uh, compare it to other uh, refugee groups, right? right. Uh, you know we're put in the position of refugees. It's... Yeah. yeah, but uh, I, I, we are at a time at, of polarization where if you if you mention this, you are really being looked at like, yeah, but I mean, this is singular right now. And I mean, there, there have been journalists, and this is your point, Sylvan, I think it's very valid, who said, well, we see, um, there have been journalists reporting from Ukraine and they were like, acting surprised all of a sudden, oh, we have refugees here and they resemble us. Oh my God, <laughs> you know, as right. if this is something surprising, as if Europeans cannot be refugees, right? Right. So, um, and now you have the race, category of race coming back in, clearly, yeah. Yeah, in the UK, they're letting in Ukrainian refugees under kind of a special program as long as mm -hmm. they have a sponsor. At the same time, asylum applicants are being sent to Rwanda from the UK. Oh, yeah, I, yeah. Wow. So there's definitely a hierarchy of, like, migrants and <laughs> refugees and who gets to move, and these these hierarchies are, of course, based on colonial categories, right? It and is. If, yeah. if you ever look at, like, British immigration, like, it's completely colonialist. Like, and the, the white English-speaking nations are at the top. Like, if you're from Canada, if you're from Australia, mm -hmm. if you're from America, you can come to the UK, that's fine. You know, and if you're on them from one of the former colonies, which are now the Commonwealth, then that's another category. And if you're from one of the others that are neither of those, well, then you can just forget it, right? Yeah. And, and yeah, it, it's absolutely, it's about race and it's about colonialism. Like, who gets to move where, right? <laughs> and who can? I mean, it's not a surprise, right? But it's just so blatant. Um, that yeah. is something that surprises me. That it can be so blatant in the public yeah. and also be legitimized in a way, you know, because it's Europe. Because it's war in Europe, uh, and then I think, yeah, <laughs> it shouldn't actually matter in a globalized world <laughs> where the war is. And I mean, that, that, it's also the idea that we are implicated directly, but we are implicated in every conflict in Afghanistan, in Yemen, because Germany is a major weapons producer, you know, uh, arms yeah. producer and selling stuff. So, and we are all entangled in economic interests there, you know. So, but yeah. it's, yeah. Not it's to just, mention that those countries exist often because of European colonialism, yeah, yeah. right? right. <laughs> we went yeah. over there, we came back, we, to them. The war, we, yeah. came back, we yeah. sent them the weapons, and then yeah. we refused to accept the refugees. That's the entire yeah. dynamic. It's but that's what about ism, actually. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's really interesting how, it's, it's like for me, it's a rhetorical move, you know, in the whole discourse. The, the accusation of whataboutism. So when it's being leveled against people and when not. So when comparison is legitimate and when it's not legitimate, you know, mm. that's very interesting to me. Also from from different political groups and how it's being used. So be, yeah. if you take like a meta <laughs> view perspective on it, um, I think it's it's one major rhetorical strategy right now to accuse others of uh, whataboutism and thereby just getting rid of any analytical context, any analytical com yeah, categories, you know. Categories always imply that there are many, um, I don't know, phenomena that can be put in these categories, right? Not only one singular event, but this is totally obscured then. And here, I mean, there are basically two explanatory patterns. Either you say the war is the outcome of a blind ideological, I don't know, um, fanaticism by, you know, from, coming from Putin, Uh, or it's just geopolitical strategy, um, also implicating the United States. But you know, to think about maybe it's all these countries, post-Soviet transformation countries, they are struggling since decades. You know, it's perhaps a crisis of political representation, stuff like this. This, if you if you op offer these categories, it's like you're downplaying suffering of Ukrainian people. But I think maybe these categories are more helpful to understand things going on. I'm I'm not sure. But it's this um, very morally, I don't know, charged debate that makes things really, really difficult to discuss. It does. It feels like analysis gets shut down. Yeah. 
right? <laughs> like false equivalency is very annoying when it happens to you, but just because you're making a comparison doesn't mean you're making a false equivalency, which is like yeah, the I mean, one you have to look it. at it, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's like this context matters, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> heard, it, heard about this before. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I see that we are approaching the one hour mark. So uh, <laughs> as much as I would, could continue this discussion all day, um, I, I want to try to wrap us up. Um, and I think that this is a, also just a really interesting note to kind of end on, um, this idea of comparison and when is comparison legitimate mm. and what is allowed to be said and analyzed through a comparison. Um, uh, yeah, I think um, we've had just... I mean, this has been a fascinating discussion for me. I want to thank um, Carmen and Susanna, both of you again, so much for joining us today. Um, and we hope to see you again soon on another episode of the Religious Studies Project. Thank you very much. Thank well, you. thank you. The RSP is sponsored by the BASR, NAASR and the IAHR and is produced by the Religious Studies Project Association, a Scottish charitable incorporated organisation. Find out more at religiousstudiesproject.com. Brought to you by editors Andy Alexander and David McConaughey and founding editors Chris Cotter and David Robertson. Our features are edited by Savannah Finver and our opportunities digest by Ella Bach. Audio editing by Alex Matthews. Video editing by Alison Isidore. Podcast transcription by Jaden Bartashius. And social media managed by Candice Mixon. Don't forget, you can support the project by using our Amazon.com, .co.uk and .ca links or donating at patreon.com backslash project rs. And you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, iTunes and all other portals. Thanks for listening.